to be back. Hope you all have had a good morning. We'll get started today uh, changing the topic a little bit. We talked a lot yesterday about when to start medications, how to start medications, and how to appropriately keep patients on medications. And now I come and tell a little bit of a different story, which is when can we stop medications for patients once they're on and doing well, which is very different than what we've been saying over the past 20 years since we've started to learn how to use anti-TNFs. We taught ourselves the lessons that once you get on these medications, you can never stop, and that patients will develop antibodies and will cause trouble, and then you'll lose response and never get it back again. But the tide is turning for a number of different reasons. One, there's been continued concern about long-term risks, specifically around immune modulators. For the more years you're on these drugs, the more trouble they can cause. And two, cost has, of course, become of global concern, particularly with the biologic drugs and trying to understand how we contend with long-term costs. So really, we turn towards thinking, if it's possible, once we get patients feeling well, can we stop their medications? Can we ever stop their medications? Yesterday, I talked about barriers of patients getting on these drugs in the first place. One barrier I didn't mention, which I think is very real, at least in my patients, is that the perception they have is once they start on these medications, they can never stop, that they now have a lifetime of dependency on biologic drugs. And what they've read is appropriate. What they've read is we don't want them to start and stop and start and stop because they develop antibodies and lose response. But the way that gets interpreted through other patients and on the internet is that they can never, ever stop these drugs once they start. And that's a barrier to beginning in the first place because they feel it's the last decision they ever have to make and it makes them more worried and resistant to start. So this idea of when can we discontinue therapy can be very helpful, not just in saving cost and saving potential long-term adverse events, but also in helping our patients get started in the first place. Because if they understand that they're going to be able to stop at some point, or maybe they can, their resistance will be much lower to getting started as they go. So we've barely convinced our field to get on the right drugs early, and now we're talking about when to stop. I talked yesterday about the very, very low numbers of people that are on biologics, but of those patients on biologics, some of them probably can stop over a period of time. We just have to do it carefully and thoughtfully. We're not there yet in understanding our decisions, but we're making good progress. So why are we even asking this? Well, our medications are working. If we use these medications early and at the right doses and optimize them, these are the patients that come back after six months or 12 months for a colonoscopy, and you can't believe how good their bowel looks. You wonder if this is even the right patient. You start questioning if they even had Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis in the first place because our medications are doing so well and leading to complete mucosal and even histologic healing. These scary side effects occur after a long duration of therapy. I didn't speak yesterday specifically around adverse events. I believe we'll talk somewhat about it later today. But there's no question that things like lymphomas or at other adverse events related to exposure is time dependent, meaning the longer they're on these medications, the longer they're at risk for being at risk for adverse events, specifically lymphomas. And as patients get older, their lymphoma risk goes up as their age goes up. These drugs are not cheap, although thiopurines and methotrexate are not the ones that are causing us trouble. As you've heard yesterday, there's an incredible barrage of new drugs coming that are going to be very, very expensive, and we have to be thoughtful about how we use these medications appropriately and can we help save cost. And then people simply prefer to take fewer or no medications. There's no question that if you ask patients what they prefer, more or less medications, the answer will always be less medications. And I think from us managing these patients, it would always be easier for them to be on fewer medications than others. So why not just stop? What are the reasons to do this? Well, number one, the disease will relapse and we won't be able to control it. That's the biggest worry, is that patients are doing well, we stop the meds, they get sick, and then we can't get it back under control like we had it before. We don't want to, as we say, rock the boat or change anything. We want to keep people well and not make them have trouble. This is the one that's very concerning to me, is the disease will progress silently and we won't know until it's too late. As you know, it's very easy to let patients go for many years without having any symptoms until they show up with pain, 
obstructive symptoms, and by that time they're ready for medications, but we know it's too late and they need their second or third or fourth surgery and not a new biologic drug to get them by. So the silent progression is trouble. Patients who are on medications, particularly immune suppressive medications, I think have enough concern that they want to come back and see us. They want to get their labs tested. They recognize that side effects are possible, so they don't typically disappear. They come and stay with us. However, if you stop medications, the worry is patients can go one year, two year, three year, or even more without coming to the doctor at all. And then you don't know it's happening, and slowly they're progressing with or without symptoms. The other is once we stop anti-TNF therapy, we won't be able to restart it. We talked a lot yesterday about immunogenicity and antibody development, and we know that a perfect way to develop antibodies is to start a drug, stop a drug, give a gap in time, and then restart the drug or do that repeatedly. We learned that from the original uh, presentations of anti-TNF, specifically infliximab, and we know that's a perfect way to lose response due to antibody development. So when can we stop therapy? Well, we don't know the answer to this, and I won't show you that we have all the answers, but we're working on this, and there's some definite hope coming in a very nice clinical trial that I'll show you is currently underway in Europe. But patients ask us this every day, and we need to have a thoughtful answer. I don't think the answer can be, no, you can never stop. It's not satisfying to them, it's not fair, and practically it's not realistic. None of our patients are gonna be on these drugs for 10, 15, 20, or 30 years. There's always gonna be something that changes. I'll review the evidence, although I'll admit it's fairly limited, but what we have is somewhat reassuring that we have the ability to do this. And with this clinical trial called BioCycle, or called SPARE, is the randomized control trial I'll show you at the end that's currently underway, we're going to have some great insights into this answer. And then I'll show you a proposed strategy for now. This is my strategy based on the evidence, but I think it's a very fair strategy about considering stopping medications in certain patients. So here are the scenarios I'll go through. There are more scenarios, of course, but I think these are the relatively common scenarios. The first is stopping azathioprine. You could argue it would be 6-mercaptopurine or methotrexate monotherapy. If patients on one of these drugs, can we stop it? How would we do that? What are the evidence? Stopping anti-TNF monotherapy. What if they're in remission on combination therapy? Which one would you stop? Could you stop the thiopurine or would you stop the anti-TNF? And what's the reasoning for both of those? What if they're in remission and stopping both on combination therapy, and how should we handle that? So I'll take these one by one. Again, they're not a huge amount of data to support this, but I'll tell you what we learned so far, at least. So this is uh, one of the studies. They're just a handful. I show you one of stopping, azathioprine with of stopping azathioprine when azathioprine is the only drug that they're treated on. The reason I show you one is the other studies that look at this are pretty similar, and they show essentially a relapse rate of about 15 to 20 percent within a year, but up to 50% after three years. So most patients relapse after a period of time when you stop azathioprine monotherapy. I'm a little less worried about this than biologics because there are, there are no antibodies, so restarting it is reasonable. However, as you know, it can take a good three or four months to get patients back on these drugs. And again, if they're silently progressing while you've stopped it and developed strictures or other complications, then the drugs are never gonna work again. Are there some risk factors that can help us sort out who's going to do well and who can't, uh, won't do well? Well, sure, there's some things you can look at. One thing that I find very useful from this study is hemoglobin. This is a hemoglobin of 12.0 on uh, our scale that we use, which shows that if patients are anemic, then they're at higher risk to relapse. It seems fairly obvious. It's probably reflective of active disease, but nonetheless, it's a simple marker to look at, and you can see the dramatic difference in those who are not anemic and had normal laboratory values versus those who have a low hemoglobin. Reintroducing azathioprine is pretty effective. If you catch people early enough, about 95% of the time, you can get people back in remission on azathioprine monotherapy. Again, that's probably gonna take a few months of corticosteroids, although we've all taught ourselves that steroids are bad and we don't want our patients on it, a few months of steroids with a good withdrawal plan and protecting their bones with calcium and vitamin D isn't a terrible thing. And I would argue if you keep a close eye on somebody, it's not unreasonable to do this, but usually not a preferred strategy. If somebody deserved and got themselves on azathioprine, presumably they were sick enough to get on that drug, and putting them at risk to get that sick again is not something that I think is a terrific strategy. This just shows some side effects that occurred with this, really just to point out the fact that these medications do have side effects. And again, although they're very unusual, 
and these types of lymphomas and myelodysplastic syndromes are very, very unusual, occurring somewhere in the range of one to six or seven out of 10,000 patients who take these medications. Nonetheless, this is one of the things that we want to think about when we have patients on long-term medications. What about anti-TNF monotherapy? If your patient's on infliximab, adalimumab, sertilizumab, golimumab, how about stopping that and seeing how they do? Well, there's amazing consistency across the world in what happens when patients stop anti-TNF therapy. Typically, about 50% of patients relapse within one year, no matter where you look at where these data are coming from. There's a Hungarian experience, the Danish experience, and then others are even a little bit higher. But again, around that 50% chance. So if a patient asks you, what's the chance that my disease will come back if I stop anti-TNF therapy? It's about 50%. About one in every two patients will fail therapy, and something will have to happen afterwards. Here's another large study that was uh, just published this past year that shows the progression of relapse over time. And you can see by looking at those in the blue, those are the patients with no relapse, and those in red or orange are those patients with relapse, that pretty quickly you get to about 50% and then it levels off. It doesn't keep going down over time, but those patients who are going to lose response probably lose response within the first one to two years, and then people do seemingly okay long-term after that, both for Crohn's disease and for ulcerative colitis. Well, what about withdrawal of one or the other if somebody's in combination therapy? So this is combination therapy on anti-TNF and immune modulator and stopping the immune modulator. What are the risks here? Can we get away with this long-term and spare them the potential long-term exposure of immune modulators such as thiopurines? Well, in this study that was published now nearly 10 years ago by uh, uh, Van Ash, it was an open-label randomized controlled trial where they had patients in remission on combination therapy, and they randomized patients to either continue both drugs or stop their concomitant immunosuppressive, which in this case was azathioprine, and they followed them for two years. There were two parts of the results that are important here. One, what happened to the patients clinically, but also what can we learn from an immunogenicity standpoint and a drug concentration standpoint when you withdraw the immunomodulator. Yesterday, uh, Dr. Irving and others taught us about how to monitor drug levels and that being on a second drug will help keep your drug concentrations up and prevent antibodies. So what happens when you stop an immunomodulator? Well, from a clinical standpoint, they did just fine. There was no increased need for rescue infliximab therapy, and there was no increased need to discontinue infliximab. So clinically, they did just all right. However, it's important to point out that this study was never powered to actually identify if there was a difference here. So this is a very underpowered study, which is its major flaw, but at least in the short term, we saw there was no big difference. What we did learn from this, however, is that from a biochemical standpoint, the patients who had stopped their immunomodulator CRP went up, which was statistically significant, and their infliximab trough levels went down. And why did their infliximab trough levels go down? Well, they developed antibodies that prevented those infliximab trough concentrations from staying up as they were competing for the drug. So there's some real biochemical differences that we see with withdrawal that makes us think that over a long period of time we're not going to get away with that. I will say, though, that was in a time before we were adjusting drug levels and, and looking at trough concentrations proactively. I think it's very possible that we can counter that by stopping an immunomodulator, checking their trough levels, making sure they keep them in a nice, healthy level, say somewhere above 5 or better yet above 10, based on the assays that we use, and keep people on anti-TNF monotherapy successful. This is an interesting one that was just uh, presented over the past couple of years that looks at what dose of thiopurine do you need if you're using combination therapy. Dr. Irving had done some work on this as well. And what this shows is, interestingly, your thiopurine, your thiopurine drug levels can probably be a bit lower than what we typically aim for. If our goals are somewhere around 230 or higher, you can see here that patients kept antibodies away and infliximab trough levels high if their level was above 125. That's about half the level of that we need to see when we're using it as a treatment dose. So it's possible that we can dose reduce these drugs and get away with keeping patients on them, lower exposure, but still give us the efficacy that we need to prevent antibodies. The one hesitation I have with this is we don't have any idea if long-term adverse events like lymphomas or infections are dose dependent at all. And there's some risk that we're taking here in being on the drug, perhaps still, still accepting the fact that there's some adverse risk to it, but 
may be losing efficacy over time. But nonetheless, I think this was interesting that tells us you might be able to get away with dose reduction of thiopurines to continue to prevent antibodies. We've seen that with methotrexate for sure, and I'm not sure what your uh, typical practice is here, but for us, we're using methotrexate orally, about 12.5 milligrams once a week, which is, again, half the treatment dose as an oral dose instead of sub-Q, when we're using it simply to prevent antibodies as, opposed to, uh, as, a, as an alternative to thiopurines. So uh, you've, most of you, I'm sure, have heard of the STORY study and seen these data presented before back in 2012, but STORY got at this question exactly what we wanted, which is if we have patients on combination therapy and we want to see if we can get away with stopping anti-TNFs, who are the patients that can, get away, get, that can get away with this and what's going to happen to patients if we want to restart anti-TNF therapy. So this is a very nicely done study of 115 patients who are in remission and off of steroids for at least six months who are on infliximab and azathioprine. The infliximab was withdrawn and they were followed for a median of another 28 months. You can see here that almost identical to the data that we saw before from around the world with anti-TNFs, that about 50% of patients flare over that first year. So again, real consistency and understanding. If your patient's in remission and you stop anti-TNF, about 50% of them are going to flare within one year. So who are these patients? Well, there's certainly risk factors that can help predict. You can see here the more risk factors you have, the quickly that line drops. The black line on top are those patients that stayed in remission, and those are patients who either had no risk factors or two or fewer risk factors. And then as you have more risk factors, which are listed along the right side, you can see that line drops more quickly. Those who rapidly recur are the blue line, then the green line next, and red and those have sequentially more risk factors for recurrence of their disease. So patients who have higher risk factors, it's probably not worth considering anti-TNFs, but those who really are doing well and don't have any of the risk factors, it's possible, and they'll probably stay in remission for quite a period of time. One thing that was interesting on here that's not listed but came out from the paper is patients who had zero drug available when they tested their trough levels actually did the best and those were patients who were at lowest risk to relapse over time. That makes you question, what are we talking about with drug concentrations if zero levels are predictive of doing well? The way I interpret that, however, is that those patients probably didn't need it in the first place, and they were probably on infliximab for years or at least a period of time without any active drug and doing fine, and therefore they kind of self-selected themselves out for being okay long-term without drug because, in a sense, they weren't getting the drug anyway, although they were getting infusions every eight weeks. So what happens when you try to reintroduce it? Well, this is the first take at story. This was their first publication. In a moment, I'll show you what the update is. At first, it was very reassuring. It's in those patients who relapsed, and again, you saw that about 50% of them relapsed, that 88% of them can get back into remission, and 98% of them had a response just after two infliximab doses. So restarting infliximab was very effective early. They had a median drug holiday, meaning they were off of drug for over six months. There were no infusion reactions and no difference in infliximab trough levels. Very reassuring. Remember, all these patients stayed on azathioprine. They weren't on nothing, but staying on azathioprine, stopping infliximab, patients did very well in the short term here from story. All patients also were pre-medicated with IV hydrocortisone, helping to prevent immune reactions during the infusions. I'm not sure how effective this is. The data actually don't really help us too much in guiding if we use hydrocortisone. I do use this in my practice, although I'm not convinced I'm doing anything more than giving a quick little bolus of steroids to our patients before infusions. So this is where the story continues, and this was just presented at DDW this past year. And it's a little bit more disappointing and tells us that the long-term outcome of this isn't as good as we had hoped from those early story studies. There's a median follow-up of seven years now. So they followed a, over 100 patients out past seven years. And you can see here in the results that there is no biologic restarted in 21% of patients. That means 80% of patients are back on therapy. So 20% did okay, but 80% of them had to go back on therapy. Of those patients who flared, there were what they called severe failure, which was surgery or perianal disease before biologic resumption in 8% of these patients. So some of these patients actually did quite poorly and really got into trouble after, remember, they were in complete remission, off of steroids, feeling great, and now we have nearly 10% of them who are getting into trouble and 80% of them who go back on drug. And then look at the outcomes after resuming infliximab. There was successful remission in 65%. 
So you could ask yourself, well, that's not terrible, but remember, before we saw almost 90% in those early studies. So now we have over a third of patients who are in complete remission, off of steroids, feeling well, and over a third of them now are sick again, and we can't get them well. So we really have to question if it's worth it, or maybe we needed to manage these patients somewhat differently. It is possible to get people off anti-TNFs, but again, many of them are relapsing over time. So let me show you how the help is on the way and tell you a little bit about this study called BioCycle. If you haven't heard of BioCycle, this is a very large and very interesting, well-done study run by Edouard Louis in Belgium using uh, 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 the ECHO and, uh, and focusing on the French cohort of patients. What they're looking at here is really a broad understanding of what happens when patients are in remission on, th on combination therapy. And they're looking at this from many different angles. It's focused around the clinical trial called SPARE, which is here, and I'll go back and show you the rest in a second. SPARE is a randomized controlled trial of patients in remission on combination therapy, and one arm is stopping azathioprine, one arm is stopping infliximab, and the other is staying on combination therapy. It's powered to look for differences. It's a multi-year study. I think they're getting up close to around the 100 patient range that are enrolled now, and this is going to take a number of years to get the answer but it's going to be very, very helpful. They're looking carefully at immunogenicity, at trough levels of recurrence of disease, and really help us understand if this is possible, and if so, which patients it's possible in. The other parts of this that are great is they're starting to look at other parts of patient decision-making and physician decision-making as well. This is my part in SPARE, is we're looking at patient and physician expectations and concerns about stopping. We've spent so much time in concerns about starting, but now, are your patients actually going to want to stop? They were sick once, now they're well. Do they want to stop therapy, and are they going to come off of therapy if you ask them to? And what about the doctors? What about us? Do we actually want to stop drugs? And if so, which drugs do we want to stop when we're balancing risk against cost? So we're in the middle of this study. We haven't started the patient part of this yet, although we did just present the provider findings. We looked at doctors from both the U.S. and France to try to get an understanding of where they are. Um, actually, I'm sorry, it was beyond just France, all through uh, the ECHO uh, group that were surveyed here. And you can see some interesting differences in how doctors from the U.S. and, uh, and those from Europe answered. So this is the, the first part of the study. Again, there's more to come on this. But the first thing we learned here is that European gastroenterologists were actually more likely to consider stopping drugs. The U.S. gastroenterologists were very protective of the patients, weren't really thinking about cost, weren't thinking too much about adverse events, but felt that they were more likely to keep their patients on both drugs long term, where the providers from Europe thought it was very reasonable to consider stopping one versus the other drug. The next question was, which drug were they more likely to stop? Are they thinking about cost? or are they thinking about adverse events? And interestingly, it was mostly about adverse events. You can see that both the European and U.S. doctors had a strong preference for stopping the immunomodulator as opposed to stopping biologic therapy. So although we saw in the STORY trial, maybe short term we can get away with this, maybe long term there are a subgroup of patients that we can get away with this, but in general, most people wanted to stop immunomodulators. I think we're going to have to wait and see what the SPARE study shows, but for now, I think this is a reasonable strategy to take. Let me show you what I do with patients, and which I think is a, an approach that makes a lot of sense now logically, although I'll be the first to admit that we need more information as it comes out. So let's take this first scenario here. In remission on mono or combination therapy, first of all, why are you stopping? Are you worried about an adverse event that may have occurred or will occur in the future? Are you thinking about cost? Is it fear of side effects? Is it your fear of side effects? Or is it your patient's fear of side effects? So when somebody comes in and says, I'm thinking about stopping, ask them why. It might purely be a cost problem that you can fix. It might be a risk problem that really is being overrepresented in their heads. And they might have forgotten how sick they were when they first got on the medications. But this is the first question to ask, is why is this question even coming up now? And then how long have they been on therapy? This isn't something you consider after three or four months. This is something that you consider after six months, one year, or maybe many years on combination therapy. But not once they get in remission, the minute they get off of steroids, that's not the time to even start considering stopping therapy. And then you really need to be sure they're in remission. This isn't asking the patient how they feel, but this is looking for endoscopic, histologic, uh, and, and biochemical evidence that they're actually in remission when you're stopping therapy.
So here are the scenarios that I proposed early. They're stopping azathioprine monotherapy, stopping anti-TNF monotherapy, and then if you're in combination, stopping one or the other or both. I would tell you that I discount these first two. I think that somebody who's on anti-TNF monotherapy and stopping it is not, the right, is not the right idea. There's a very high risk they're going to relapse. Without being on an immunomodulator, you're probably not going to be able to restart that drug, and I think it's not a reasonable approach. If somebody's in combination therapy, I don't think stopping both drugs is a good option either. So let's look at the others and how you might manage that. If you're stopping azathioprine monotherapy, I think this is reasonable. I think with close follow-up with endoscopy and imaging six to 12 months later, and then every one to two years. So see how they're doing after you stop it. Even if they feel well, they need an endoscopy. You need to understand if their disease is returning or progressing any further. And then regularly I follow them with a CRP or fecal calprotectin to understand if their disease is starting to sneak in despite the fact that they feel well. What if you're in remission on combination therapy and you want to stop the thiopurine or methotrexate? Well, you need to do everything we said above. They need close follow-up, but in addition to that, you need to optimize their anti-TNF dosing. These are the patients where I try to get their trough levels above 10. I want their trough levels either for infliximab or adalimumab to be as high as I can to prevent antibodies from forming when they're not on a second drug. Well, what about if you're stopping anti-TNFs? This part makes me a little bit nervous with the data that we saw from the long-term follow-up from Story. However, it's reasonable, but in that case, you need to figure out if you can figure out thiopurine dosing. I think that might be hard here, and that might make things a little bit more difficult. But if you can leave somebody in azathioprine monotherapy, trying to get their drug concentrations really into a nice range above 250, 300, and following them progressively, again, with endoscopy and imaging, is a reasonable thing to do. So in summary, we do need more data, although I think we're making progress on this question. This is a real question that we're going to have to ask ourselves over time, a lot having to do with cost. There's a real risk of relapse in immunogenicity, but you can consider de-escalation in carefully selected patients if you watch them carefully. We have to do it for the right reasons. Make sure, please, ask your patient why they're bringing that up or ask yourself why you're bringing that up so that we're making decisions in the right patients who are actually in remission. And stopping a drug may mean less intensive therapy, but it really should go along with more intensive monitoring. I tell my patients who want to de-escalate therapy that that's okay, but they have to understand that they're coming in in six months for an endoscopy and probably annually for an endoscopy if I'm worried about them. But many patients like that trade-off, and they happily come in to make sure their disease isn't coming back. So with that, I tell you that my default is continuing therapy unless I'm pushed to stop it. But if we want to stop it, we're gathering some more data to make sure that it's safe. Again, thank you for ha being here. Uh, thank you for having me. And it's wonderful to have the opportunity to talk with you.